Hi, and welcome to the Bees Knees Podcast. This is your host, PJ Ewing. I am really excited today to share some amazing new findings with you about knee rehabilitation and, in fact, equipment, uh, gear, uh, the most important tool, let's say, uh, to help people recover well. And that is, in fact, uh, called the X10 machine, but it's known, its classification is a PMKR machine, Pressure Modulated Knee Rehabilitation. And I have, uh, as a guest on the show, one of the authors of a study that was published in 2018 by the Global Journal of Orthopedics Research, all about this topic and comparing the X10 directly with traditional physical therapy, as well as a CPM machine. So it's a pretty interesting conversation. We also go into some other topics like what research is ongoing and you know uh, what, what's really gonna be in, the, in front of us in terms of new research for X10. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the guest and I'll also tell you a bit about his co-author for the study. So let's learn about Dr. Freeman. Dr. Carl Freeman, he is the Director of Clinical Research at X10. Dr. Freeman has had an illustrious career in academia writing many well-reviewed papers on knee physiology, recovery, and rehabilitation. He has worked with many notable orthopedic surgeons and physiotherapists and has helped the team at X10 immensely in gathering the data that has proven uh, the clinical value of the X10 knee recovery system. In addition to his invaluable work at X10, Dr. Freeman is a senior faculty advisor with honors at Wayne State University. Dr. Freeman's co-author of this study that we'll go into in our interview is Dr. Paul Rubel. Dr. Paul Rubel has been practicing physical therapy for over 40 years. He is the owner of one of the original private practices in Southeast Michigan, physical therapy specialists. Physical therapy specialists treats all age groups and conditions. Moreover, the clinic is a certified Medicare rehabilitation agency. In addition to practicing physical therapy, Dr. Rubel also is diligent about his continuing education. He teaches, mentors, is an internationally peer-reviewed published researcher. He has served in leadership roles on several profession-specific boards and is a hospice volunteer therapist. Over the last 30 years, he has had the pleasure of serving his profession and community, providing expert testimony in the area of physical therapy and rehabilitation with extensive experience in both defendant and plaintiff work, averaging approximately four to six cases per year. He sees it as an extension of his life's work and yet another way to both help shape, uphold, and protect the standards of his profession and be an advocate for the patient's rights to quality care and ethical medicine. With his extensive experience, expertise, and winning results and strategies, he is a strong and reliable uh, asset, and in fact was a a very important contributor to this piece of research. That said, I'll just reiterate, I've been very excited to share this with you. The research was years in the making. The results were published, as I mentioned, in December, and now we have that research, and I'll share a link uh, on the show page. It's very interesting to read because it does illustrate the value of the CPM machine, or lack of value, the value of the X10 machine, and really how they compare with one another, as well as to direct physical therapy, traditional physical therapy. So by reading the research and listening to this interview, you'll understand a lot more about what works and what doesn't and really why. If you'd like to look up the study right now, you can find it at a website for the Global Journal of Orthopedics Research. Iris Publishers is the name of the company behind that journal. The name of the article is Our Computer Controlled Pressure Modulated Knee Rehabilitation Machines Valuable Following Knee Arthroplasty. And again, the authors are Paul J. Rubel and D. Carl Freeman. Welcome to The Bee's Knees, a podcast full of articles, interviews, clinical studies, and advice about knee surgery, physical therapy, and life after knee surgery. Okay, this is PJ Ewing, and I am sitting in Lower Manhattan, uh, and I'm here with Dr. Carl Freeman. Hi, Carl. How are you? I'm doing well. Yourself? I am good. I'm happy to be on the phone with you. I have got to be honest. Uh, Carl, you are in Michigan right now, and we're, we're going to talk we'll talk a little bit about research. Um, I, I asked Carl to join us because Carl and I have worked together for a long time at X10. 
years, probably four or five years, Carl, at this point, I think, right? It is, I think, about five years. <laughs> Amazing. Flying. Time is flying. I think about the first time I met you and the research that was starting right then. And it was it was an exciting time, and it is now because we get to t- today, we actually get to talk about um, a few studies and in a comparison, so a few different things that X10 has been up to and Carl has been up to uh, on the research fr- front to start to establish what is the X10, what does it do, how does it compare to the broad body of research that's out there. Um, and you've completed a study that was published in December, which is we're going to go through. We're also going to talk about this, uh, and I'll try to get the name right, Joaquin Kalatayud study that was made famous uh, by a, a publication in the Wall Street Journal, by an article in the Wall Street Journal. So we're going to talk about that as well. And in fact, we'll probably start there. And then we're going to finish with what research you're kind of doing now with X10 in mind. Uh, but, Carl, before all those wonderful things that we'll, we'll cover today, um, let's talk about you. You're, you know, who are you? What's your background? How did you get to X10? Um, what, what have you been doing with X10? You know, let's, the floor is yours, Carl. <laughs> well, um, I'm a professor, I'm actually a professor emeritus at uh, Wayne State University in biology. Uh, one of my specialties was teaching statistics. So I do a lot of statistics and a lot of research. I came to, to X10 in a very circuitous route I've had lots of knee surgeries. By my count, I've had 21, and that includes um, getting uh, two TKAs, one on each knee, and then two revisions on my left knee, which were really no fun. And and so um, your dad, the founder, was talking to a friend of his, Paul Rubel, who owns his own physical therapy clinic and who, by the way, has an X10 in his physical therapy clinic. And he was saying, your dad was saying that um, we needed to do research and get data and analyze it. And, And Paul recommended me for the job because Paul and I have published probably a dozen papers together. And, and my role in all those papers was to, to deal with the analysis and the numbers. And, and so Paul recommended me to your father, and, and your father called me, and that's how it all got started. Amazing. And besides working with Dr. Rubel, you've also worked with other orthopedic surgeons uh, in publishing, haven't you? Uh, I have. Um, I have a, pa- a paper out, but it, it, it doesn't relate to, to, to me so much as it related to anesthesiology. I think. Okay. Okay, but you've been down this research path obviously many times. Um, well, I've done my own research. Um, yeah. I've I've published approximately 180 papers, so I've done a lot of research over my career. I'm feeling more and more fortunate to have you on this call right now, and that's that's great. I didn't realize that, Carl. Wow. Um, okay, so you found X10 circuitously, obviously, and now you're doing research, and it was. So let's go through. Let's let's start there then. Let's let's start with the uh, the work that you did with Dr. Rubel on the the X10, the piece that was was published, um, looking at you know devices and total knee arthroplasty and recovery. Um, so what was the focal point of that study, the the piece that was published so recently? There were really two goals to that study. The the first goal was to compare the X10 to a CPM. Okay, back to then, the, the version of the X10 we were working with at that time only did range of motion, and the CPM was supposed to do range of motion. And we um, compared our results to the um, paper cited in a, a very important review called the Cochrane Review, on CPM. They published a review in 2014 in which they l- looked at all of the randomly controlled studies that had been done. And in there they reported the range of motions that people were getting and how fast they were getting them. 
And what we did was to compare our results to those published results. And in every single instance, we found that the X10 was superior. Now it's uh, almost ridiculous to compare the X10 to the CPM because the CPM has been shown time and again not to be efficacious now. And the X10 has moved beyond range of motion and also has strengthening modules. And that's kind of where I'm going with the new research is looking at how well X10 improves strength in addition to range of motion. It's interesting because uh, I know you know the value of the CPM and the comparison to X10 so well. We deal with this every day. But the reason I deal with it every day is that it's still out there. It's still being sold or rented. Some surgeons still lean on the CPM, which, you know, constantly amazes me that that's, that's the case. Because, well, and maybe it's because we have seen the research and really understand the failings of the CPM. And I know we've published on that topic as well. Um, and it's not known by so many. Uh, and it's almost, I feel, for me, it's almost like a mission. Hey, you know, I don't want to just throw rocks at the CPM. I, I want you to know the data, understand the research, look at all the studies that have been published that show very clearly the failings of that device. The other thing, though, in that study, right, the study that, the, that you published with Dr. Rubel, um, it was the CPM numbers were actually similar to regular physical therapy, weren't they? Um, what this, the previous studies had shown is that the CPM got no better numbers than no CPM. Right. So just using standard physical therapy achieved the same numbers as CPM. There were some technical issues with the CPM. The, the first is that the machine simply moves back and forth, but the machine itself moves. In some cases, it walks off the bed. Uh, which is very bad for the patient. But uh, the, the technical problem is that it always changed the alignment. And, and so as a consequence of that, when the alignment changed, it became very painful. And that also meant that it was not a uniform um, procedure to use. So patients would strap themselves in and turn the machine on, and pretty soon their alignment was off, and that caused pain, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So that became a problem. And they found that they could not solve that problem even if they bolted the machine in bed. Right. So, which, which is a, an effort you would never go to in your own home. So it doesn't work. Uh, doctors, as <clears throat> one of them said to me once, <laughs> We prescribe it so we can be seen to be doing something. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's a very, very poor reason for doing anything. So the study that you and Dr. Rubel published in December of 2018 is called Our Computer Controlled Pressure Modulated Knee Rehabilitation Machines Valuable Following knee arthroplasty. So PMKR, pressure modulated knee rehabilitation. Um, to me, the question I've got, the first one is, and I, you know, the CPM, okay, it has its, you know, certain results after total knee arthroplasty, knee replacement. Does this indict traditional physical therapy as well? Can I take the leap to say, well, if the CPM is the same as regular physical therapy, and the X10, that, those are the numbers for the CPM, and the X10 numbers are over here. Can I group CPM and, and traditional physical therapy together in terms of that's what you get when you, get, you do those two things? Well, there's no difference between CPM and traditional therapy. So if we're better than CPM use, we're better than the physical therapy. Right, right. So you can take that leap to say CPM and CPM. Yes, PT. yes, you, you, you can take that leap. Okay. Um, and, and the numbers are quite different. It's not just a, you know, academic, oh, it's, you know, 3% better. It's significantly better. I'm looking at the study now, uh, pressure modulated knee rehabilitation. So that's code for the X10. Uh, the numbers were after 30 days around 116 degrees range of motion. 
one of the benchmarks that you were looking at, compared to the review study, so all of this bundle of studies in the Cochrane Review, which was around 83 degrees, um, and that was at six weeks. So even giving the benefit of the doubt to the, the review studies, um, six weeks delivers 83 degrees, um, 116 degrees at, at, for X10 at 30. Is that, can I just look at that and say that's the case, or have, has time changed that at all over the last few years? Um, no, time, time has not changed that. Uh, at, at the end of four weeks, the X10 is still delivering about 115 to 120 degrees range of motion on average. Um, the results of physical therapy, and, and we're going to discuss uh, an, another article on physical therapy in a few minutes, has not changed. Matter of fact, what we found that at one month post-surgery with the uh, catalotiude study, right. that they are still getting 82 degrees range of motion at 30 days. Ah, I didn't actually note that. So moving from our, our original study, which was the, uh, the arthroplasty big piece that was published in December. Now, also in December, there was the other article, which is, uh, so let me see if I can get this right. High-intensity preoperative training improves physical and functional recovery in the early postoperative periods after total knee arthroplasty, a randomized controlled tri trial. That is not poetry. That's hard to say. <laughs> um, but that's the Kala Tayud study that you referred to that was made famous again by Cheryl Stitzel McCarthy in the Wall Street Journal. Um, you're saying that the 82, so the similar numbers to what we saw in Cochrane uh, were shown there? Yeah, they're very, they're, they're, they're within a degree or two. That's fascinating. They're within a degree or two. Whereas the X10 uh, in the study I'm working on right now, our average range of, mo range of motion at uh, 30 days was 120 degrees. It's unbelievable because, you know, I, I, there was a while, you know, we were all uh, 2014 study, the Cochrane collaboration, the Cochrane review, big deal, big deal. But then I thought we were starting to worry that, you know, shoot, that was looking back over a, an extended period of time. The numbers may have changed. You know, surgeries are better. Therapy is improving. The world is, is getting, you know, improving, right? And now yeah. you're saying two years later, 2016, a different study that was you actually know, was 2017 2017 okay 2017 that was its official publication date I see I got it got it got it got it so 2017 three years later we're seeing the same poor numbers and you know it's funny I I do quote these numbers when I'm speaking with patients and we're doing therapies and our coaching team nobody wants to believe it it's so low 82 83 degrees you know weeks well, and weeks post surgery you know remember the old dictum uh, surgeons used to be happy if their patients got 90 degrees in 90 days. Wow. Now, now that has actually changed, and they're they're looking for for um, at at three weeks they're looking for about 95 degrees. Okay. okay. But but we're we're running much higher than that, like 112, 115 degrees mm -hmm. at three weeks. Yeah. Well, it is amazing because you do hear tremendous enthusiasm for the new devices and we've got macoplasty and we're doing a lot of bilateral work and but i think what's, what's really getting people and, and you know what we end up doing a lot which is rescuing people from bad recoveries um is the expectations have changed so we have a younger population we have people that are athletic people that have you know, desire to get right back to their activities before the knee pain started. And they're in that same world of rehab and surgery, which delivers not great results uh, for a lot of people. And as expectations change, they're increasingly disappointed with what they've got and they end up finding us one way or the other, or their surgeon just is out, out in front of it and is, is recommending the X10. Uh, but it, it again, it, it, it sort of echoes you know, while things are getting better and, you know, infection rates are going down and, you know, there's good stuff happening, obviously, it's not, um, it has not resulted in that dramatic of a difference in, in the results. Well, the surgeons have actually, with the surgeries, 
have made good progress. They're using minimally invasive techniques. They're, they're going to uh, outpatient uh, centers to do the surgery in a day and sending the patients home in a day. They have made, they've changed the anesthesia protocols, they've changed the pain protocols. They have made some really substantial strides, but it ends there. Once they're done, then the patient goes to physical therapy, and that has not progressed much. So it's still pretty much where it was um, more than a decade ago, probably two decades ago. So that's the problem. And, of course, the surgeon turns the patient over to the physical therapist under the hope that the therapist is going to uh, be able to restore their range of motion and their strength. And and it isn't happening uh, as, as well as it could. Interesting. You know, I, I I echo that. I hear that. I believe that the surgery and the infection rates and the, the delivery of the patient post 45 two minutes to an hour, you know, after surgery, that's, that's just getting better. Um, but I think that surgeons, that's their wheelhouse. They're really good in that theater, that operating theater, moving oh, outside yeah. of that space. That's the, in the hands of the PA and the good physical therapy team. And like, go get them guys. I, I did a great surgery. Please just take it from here. And I think most surgeons would rather that happen. And they just, they, they really love surgery. They're really good at it. And now the problem, the ball has been pushed to the next group of folks. And that's where we haven't seen these, these, these big improvements in PT. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. Yeah, yeah. So, well, have we, have we covered this enough, Dr. Freeman? Because there's a lot in the paper. You do refer to arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Um, it's a great read, and I'll put a link to this whole thing. Is there more we should say about your study with Dr. Rubel? Um, really, the other purpose of the study was to introduce surgeons to the X10. And, of course, when it's published, that's our attempt to introduce them to the X10. So, no, I think we've pretty much covered the waterfront on that one. Okay, good. And I, I will, again, post links in the notes on this uh, episode of the podcast because um, it's a, believe it or not, it's a good read. You did well, Dr. Freeman. It's, it's easy to understand if you're a layman like myself, and um, it's illuminating the information there. And it's, it's uh, published by the Global Journal of Orthopedics Research uh, by irispublishers.com. I will, again, put links and try to make it easy to find so that you can read the study. It's a, a two, three or four pages. It's got some great graphs in it. It's a good read to understand. You know, even if you're not poking around about the X10 machine, if you're just trying to get the skinny on the CPM machine and physical therapy in general, general physical therapy after knee replacement, this is a really great resource to use. All right, so let's move on then to this other piece that you wrote a commentary on basically, which was the prehab uh, results uh, from that 2017 study. Uh, the primary author was Joaquin Katalayud, Kalatayud, darn it, Joaquin Kalatayu study. Um, what what was that study all about, and, and what, what did you do with that in terms of your comparisons? Well, th- th- you, you you need some background. Okay, okay. the background yeah. is 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 this. Um, we know that patients have been losing strength and losing range of motion. Uh, well, I should back up and say we know that people who have osteoarthritis of the knee have been losing strength and losing range of motion for years. And we also know from a lot of research that the best predictor of how patients recover is the condition of their leg going into surgery. And so that leads you to the logical question is, Well, if I could improve the condition of the leg going into surgery through exercises and stretches and those sorts of things, would it change the outcome? All right. And and so there are lots of dozens and dozens of papers out there on prehab. And the results are very ambiguous. Part of that comes from the nature of, this, of the studies. Uh, 
and, and what they do for their intervention. So some of the studies have uh, home exercises that people use with TheraBands and they do stretching and they count, stand at their counters and do exercises. Um, some of them are very gentle. Some of them have patients doing squats, which are not gentle. Okay. And, and so you, um, there are studies out there which stimulate the leg muscles with electrodes uh, and, and do that uh, as a way of strengthening the muscles. Other studies, like the, uh, I think it's Catalatayu, or I'm, I'm having a hard time Me with too, the name right? you are. <laughs> yeah. Kalatayu. Good God, that's a hard name to say. Kalatayu. Right? So <laughs> what he... What he what he said in his paper is, no, you can't do um, n not very stressful exercises. You've got to have an intensive prehab to right. make a difference. Right. And so he, 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 he had two groups, a group that got prehab and a group that didn't get prehab. And the group that didn't get prehab just had standard physical therapy after surgery and didn't really do anything before surgery. They went to the educational classes and did that sort of thing. But then the ones that, that were in the intervention group, he worked with them. Um, they, they did knee extensions. They did knee flexions. They did stretching exercises. And he gave them a very intensive uh, workout. Now, he looked at uh, things like range of motion, so he did flexion, he did extension, um, he, he uh, had a stair test to see how fast people could go up and down stairs, they, they exercised the uh, hamstrings with, he did um, isometric knee flexions, he, he did isometric knee extensions, and he did hip adductions. So those were the exercises that they actually did. Uh, in an attempt to to improve the leg. Intense. Okay. I mean that that's a serious regimen. How long? Did it's a very serious that? regimen. How long was huh? that activity? How long did they do the prehab? In that. They study? did it for eight weeks. Oh wow. Okay. That's serious stuff. Yeah. So that was serious stuff. Now, part of the problem is that not many people were willing to participate. Right. He only had about a 34% compliance rate because hmm. most people didn't want to travel to the clinic. When you're doing um, uh, exercises for your hamstrings and your quadriceps, the isometric knee extensions and knee flexions uh, work, that requires machines. Right. And so it can't be done in the home um, because you've got these big weight machines that have to be involved in that. And so those had to be done at a clinic. And uh, he started with, I think, 125 patients or 126 patients. And I, if my memory is right, 82 of them refused to do it. Hmm. So he, he was down to, to 44. They just did not want to travel to a clinic. Okay, now just as an aside, the X10 is a machine which does knee extensions and knee flexions, but it's put in the home because it doesn't work against weights. It works against pressure, and pressure is something we can control. And so it's small, it's portable, it goes in the house, and patients can use it in their, at their, anytime they choose in the convenience of their own home. Which means they'll do it. <laughs> I mean, which means that they will do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that was uh, important. So, but what he did find, he he had his control groups and he had his experimental groups, and for each of the parameters that he listed, he found a significant difference. Okay, validating the, prehab, basically saying if you go through this intense program across eight weeks, you're one of the 44, kind of the 44, um, you will see positive results, basically. You will see positive results one month post-surgery right. to, to three months post-surgery, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, it was good that, that they found that, okay? 
Sure. But his results pale in comparison to the X-10. And even though he, he doesn't really discuss this in the paper, he did provide us with the data to look at it. All right? And, and so when we, when we look at his flexions, um, if, if, we, if, if we look at his, his control group flexion, uh, they had 102 degrees of range of motion before surgery, and one month after surgery, they're at 82 degrees. Wow. Whereas his intervention group started out at 104 degrees, and one month after surgery, they're at 88 degrees. Okay, was the, the intervention group better than the control group? You bet. Does it compare to the X10's 120 degrees? No. Because at 88 degrees, you don't have um, enough flexion to enable you to go up and down stairs, to enable you to get in and out of a car, uh, to, to do a lot of activities that you would normally do. 120 degrees permits you to do just about all activities. Right. So there's a meaningful difference. I mean, they're, they're proof you know, in the research that they did, which is wonderful that they've done this comparison to an intervention group and a traditional group, so intervention with prehab, control group without, was that there is a modest improvement in range of motion post-surgery based upon the work that they did beforehand. Well, did they look at strength at all in that? They study? looked at was strength. They, okay, they, what happened they, there? They, um, this is isometric knee flexion. They had a baseline for their control group of 9.1 kilograms, okay? Now, that would be approximately uh, 20 pounds, All right. okay? And one month after surgery, it went from 9.1 down to 3.9. Okay. So there's so, a big decrease in strength. And what was that? So which which measurement are we talking about? Was that uh, this was flexing? isometric? This was hamstring strength. Hamstring strength. Okay. okay. So flexing the knee. So his control backwards. group dropped a lot. Now his um, his intervention group went from nine point two to eight point seven. So they were okay. better. Yeah. They were better, but they didn't get back to their baseline. X ten for flexion has a ten percent surplus. So, so more than here, got back. This is really, really important for everyone to understand. We're talking about how strong you are before surgery, going, you know, a couple days going in, right? There you are, surgery. Yeah. And what happens a month later after surgery? There's a famous, you know, statistic that shows there's a tremendous decline in strength for almost everybody. In this intervention group, there was a little decline. So that's good. In the control group, there was that traditional big decline in strength. Yeah, and that's so, just standard physical therapy. Right. You're just going to be weaker. You've been inactive. You have some muscle atrophy. You've been worried about bending the knee. You've been dealing with just recovery. You've lost right. a lot of strength. Those guys, those 44, found themselves down, but not down, you know, not bad. After all that effort, not terrible. And you're saying, though, with the X10, that even beats those numbers with what we do. Uh, so, So with X10, it's a prehab effort on the machine, then rehab on the machine, then we compare the data. Is that, is that right? That's right. Now, okay. the, the, the hamstring is not the pivotal muscle. Um, that's the one we've just discussed. Right. The quadricep is the pivotal muscle. So if I look right. at their control group, they were starting out at 23 and a half kilograms. That would be between 50 and 60 pounds, okay? Okay. And... Bef and that was their baseline. One month after surgery, they're down to 7.7. 7. Wow. Huge decline in quadriceps strength, which, again, is the pivotal, how you get up off of a couch, what you really need to do stairs. That's, that's, that's the muscle we care most about, isn't it, the muscle group? Yeah. Well, now if we look at their intervention group, they too started out at 23.5 kilograms, and they went down to 8.9. So they're losing okay. about 60% of their strength. There you go. Even, yeah. though, even though the intervention group's better than the control group, 
Right. Not statistically better, but it's better than the control group. They're losing strength. Whereas with the X10, we not only in, in 30 days regain their full preoperative strength, but the X10 patients have a 20% surplus. Wow. They're better than when they went in for surgery. And with the catalotiud uh, study, they're worse by yeah. far. They're 60% worse than when they went in before surgery. You know, one thing I'm learning is that we're getting good at saying calatayud. That's, that's, that's a good step forward for us. It's amazing. And it's almost like you want to shout from the mountaintops, you know, hey, everybody, look over here. There is a much better way um, than even an intensive eight-week process of, you know, going to a clinic and doing the hamstring and the quad work. I mean, you can do you can do this in a shorter period of time on a machine in your home, and the results are significantly better. And, you know, again, back to what I said earlier, right, expectations. We expect to get back to tennis and back to golf and back to, you know, jogging. Oh, even. yeah. You know, and, you want to be able to squat down and look your grandchild in the eye. Right. You're too young for that experience yet, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I am just a little bit. Uh, but you know, but these surgeries are younger. I mean, I'm getting a lot of 50 year olds now, men and women, having one or two knees done. I mean, you know, there's 40 years ahead of a lot of these people, and uh, their expectations are, yeah, okay, did the knees? Let's let's get back at it. Um, and you're going to get that much better odds, if not, you know, assurance that you're going to get that if you do this prehab, rehab on the X10. Can we talk a little bit about our comparison? Well, let, me, let me explain why you get the better results on the X10. Great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, there, the X10 has several important features. One is it has these patented pressure sensors that sense when the patient is guarding their leg, and the machine actually will stop because... You guard your leg when you're starting to experience pain. And so the machine will actually stop, back up, okay, and take the pressure off. So when it senses that you're about to enter the painful zone, it stops. It does not hurt you. All right? That's critical. Mm -hmm. um, because usually when you go into a physical therapist's office, you know, they have you sit up on a table or lay on a table, and they bend your leg as much as they can uh, until you stop them because you can't tolerate the pain anymore. Oh, oh, okay. It's very painful. With the X10, it's not painful. The machine itself moves slowly, moves gently, and, and senses the pain. Now, the next thing is it's under the patient's control. So the patient can decide um, if they want to increase their pressure by a pound or increase their range of motion by a pound, uh, that's entirely up to them. And, and they don't put themselves in pain. So it doesn't hurt. It's in the home. Patients can use it whenever they want. And because it doesn't hurt, and, and this is a, th these things are critical, patients will use it multiple times a day, seven days a week. So usually you go to outpatient physical therapy three days a week for about an hour, and they push on your leg, and they have you work some machines and, and do that sort of thing. But the machines are, are just weight machines. There's no computer-controlled arm that will sense if it hurts or not. You have to experience the pain to find out that it hurts. Mm -hmm. And then you've got done damage, and then it swells. Okay, and then you then that hurts because the pressure receptors are really what pain receptors are. And so when you have swelling, that hurts. Now, we do other things with the X10 that, that are critical. I just mentioned that, that swelling's a problem. We actually, and this is the only place I know of where, we, where people are encouraged to exercise their calf muscles. When you get fluid in and around the knee, Gravity pulls that down into your lower leg, and your lower leg swells, and you've got to get rid of the fluid to get rid of the pain. And when your calf muscles contract, that pumps the fluid into the lymph, and then it goes to the heart, and then it goes to the kidneys and out the, the urinary tract. And so you get rid of the fluid. 
So X10 patients typically have much less swelling, which means much less pain. Matter of fact, we had a PA the other day say that um, at two to three weeks, they've stopped using opioids to control pain and for the most part are just using over-the-counter things like Tylenol. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of the pain enables them to do the range of motion exercises and the strengthening exercises in their own home, pain-free, and, and for the range of motion, it's multiple times a day. For the strengthening exercises, it's every other day, okay? But they do them because right. it doesn't hurt. And the consequence of all of that is that they get better much faster. It's at, yeah, you add these all together, um, and you end up with you know a, a, a much clearer picture. You know, two to four weeks post surgery. I'm looking at the the data from the the Kalatai you'd compared to the X10 work that you've done, and you mentioned 35 percent compliance for the that study, 94 percent for X10, but in every measure, flexion extension, hamstring strength, quadricep strength, the X10 was uh, better across the board when you look at the three weeks, four weeks post-surgery numbers. I mean, some incredible differences from losses of flexion extension to, 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 gains. to gains. Yeah, it's really, it's really astounding. Is, is that, the, is that the, the way to go? Is it three weeks, two weeks? Do you need all that time prehab? To get this you, you need at least, in, in my opinion, you need at least two weeks of X10 prehab okay. um, to, to get the, the good results. And uh, prehab, you, you know, prehab has other benefits that we don't talk about, okay? Because people do get better, and the, the Catalotayud study shows that, that people do get better, with prehab as opposed to the control, but people have better physical functioning. Um, they have better general health. They function better in a social setting, and they are emotionally better. There's a, a, a wonderful study that was done by uh, Brown et al. in 2012, which looked at patient self-reporting on uh, standardized scales that assessed those, those things. And what they found was <coughs> the prehab group is vastly superior to the just standard physical therapy group in all of those things. And it makes sense. If you have greater physical functioning because of prehab and the Calatayud study and our studies show that that is indeed the case, then you are less a burden on your family and on your caregivers. Right. And yes, you will feel better emotionally because you are more independent. I think there's a lesson here for those who are approaching surgery and may not get on our beautiful X10 machine in that you do want to pay attention to the pre-surgery work and you know you will reap some of the benefits. And I know that you know, hospitals and surgeons are all echoing the same thought, which is, yeah, get, get prepared. Get in there. Get your mind, get your body ready, prepared for the surgery. The stronger you are going in, the better you're going to be afterwards. The better range of motion you have going into surgery, the better you're going to be afterwards. So this, these are universal truths, I believe, and that study helped to echo that. But what it didn't do, which thankfully you have done, is that, okay, <clears throat> got it. We, we have a better way to you know, get better results. There's a much more significant impact you can have on your recovery with this particular device if you can, if you can get access to it. Um, well, that, all of that's true. If I couldn't get access to the device, I should still do prehab. Right. Okay. And obviously, it needs to be a fairly intensive prehab. You know, sometimes they count the hospital class as prehab. That's not really prehab. That's educational. Prehab means you have to do exercises. And unfortunately, uh, if you're using standard machines, it means that you have to work against forces using a leg that hurts. Mm. Okay, with the X10, we can kind of take that pain out of the equation. 
But it's better to do prehab than not to do prehab, even if it hurts. Right. Right. And that's, again, they're, all these factors are interrelated. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the advice. I want to do prehab. I can't move. I can't even walk. I, I'm bone on bone. How the heck am I going to do prehab if I'm in, all, in this, this difficulty? Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are, you know, thanks for the advice, guys, but <laughs> it's really hard. And again, you know. The it is really is, hard. Yeah. 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 X, X10 has some virtues that, that set it apart. But we don't need to go into all that stuff. I just It's just that the data suggests that the X10 is, is a great prehab tool as well as a rehab tool, obviously. And, um, and I'm glad that we did this comparison. We've probably beaten this one to death, haven't we? Is there anything else from that comparison that, that we have? No, said? not really. I, I, I think we've pretty much covered it. A for effort. We're doing good here. Um, all right. Well, let's go into, the I think, the final topic here, which is, you're continuing to do research uh, on the X10. Uh, what can you can you you know peek under the tent? What, what's going on there? What are you looking at? What what should we? Well, at the moment, I'm I'm writing a paper on the value of prehab, okay. which is a topic we've kind of beat up. But um, what, what I have to demonstrate, and what I have demonstrated, is that prehab does make a change in the condition of your leg before you go into surgery, okay? The range of motion increases by about 15.6 degrees, all right? Mm -hmm. So if you have two weeks of prehab and you, you start at 100 degrees range of motion, two weeks later on the X10, you're gonna have about 116 degrees range of motion. So you're going into prehab better. Prehab also makes a difference in your, in your strength. If we look at quadricep strength, um, when patients start out, they start out being able to uh, move about 51 pounds of pressure, and two weeks later, they're moving 62 pounds of pressure. So it, it really does make a, a difference. And so in the, the better condition your leg is going into surgery, the better you come out of surgery, we can demonstrate that, in fact, we, we do improve the condition of the leg going into surgery. And then, of course, we also show that we uh, are improving the condition of the leg coming out of surgery. And, and that's critical. We, um, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned maybe earlier in this, this talk, we end up helping people who are not doing well at four or five, six weeks, eight weeks post-surgery. That's become a big thing. People are finding us through friends, through the internet, through their surgeons. And uh, the big question is, we'll see, how, how were you before surgery? What was your range of motion like? That's the, almost the, the million dollar question because, oh shoot, I didn't have much of a bend before surgery and now I'm still struggling. Well, okay, it all makes sense. It's very predictive you know, your range of motion pre-surgery and that what you just said is if you can gain 15 degrees of bend, your body is now ready for that post-surgery. It's now in much better shape to regain that after surgery than it would be if, if your, your quads hadn't stretched in three years to anything beyond 90 degrees or something like that. So the body yeah. got to be ready for, to take this new knee and, and run with it, really. Well, the body also has to be ready in terms of strength. Strength is something that the medical community is starting to pay more attention to. Initially, the first parameter that they still look at is do you have the range of motion? How far can you extend and bend your leg? That's their first priority. But strength is now becoming their second priority because it's one thing to be able to bend your knee, and it's quite another thing to, to be able to, to, to have weight bearing when you bend your knee. And there's a, a wonderful paper out now which looked at um, weight bearing activities and what they find is that uh, patients uh, coming out of knee surgery, even though they have a range of motion, cannot support weight throughout that full range of motion. And so that, the, the, the lack of strength is what ends up hindering them. And those strength deficits are very apparent. We, we talked about the 
Calatayud study where they had a strength deficit coming out after 30 days. And almost every study that has examined strength has a strength deficit. Matter of fact, the, the standard figure in the literature is one month post-surgery, patients are, have a 50 to 60% strength deficit. Now, that contrasts with the 20% strength surplus of the X10. So we really do strengthen them and we allow them to be able to do weight bearing through more of their range of motion, that is to engage in more activities than if they just had standard therapy. It's so crucial. I, I've witnessed working with a patient in New Jersey a few years ago, and we had spent a tremendous amount of time getting his range of motion back, and it was a real tricky one. He, he was you know, way post-surgery, and you know, range of motion was bad, and we had to avoid a manipulation. It was this little, you know, saga, right? And we get there. We get the range of motion, and we're all you know, breathing a sigh of relief until you know, it all kind of comes very clear that while we've been doing all this range of motion work, <laughs> um, we haven't done any strengthening and haven't done any strengthening. And, and it was, you know, just because we were there for a job. The job was range of motion. And it then took another three weeks for this gentleman to be able to walk upstairs in his house because we had to go, you know, add strengthening to the, the protocol. And then we got him back to normal life. But I watched this sleight of frame lovely gentleman, you know, who had gotten his bend back but could not walk stairs because his quads were just, they weren't there. They just were still And, of course, small. now the X10 has the load cells, which enable us to, to work on the quad simultaneously while we're working on the range of motion. Yeah. It didn't, yeah. Used, to, didn't, didn't used to do that. Right. But right. The, right. the data I'm getting now strongly uh, shows that we, we get the strength back and we get the range of motion back, and it's better than when patients went into surgery, which is what you need because the average patient has been losing strength for about eight years going into surgery. Yeah, there's a reason that they're going through this drastic step. Remember, this was the, the, the big red button, the, oh, boy, I, I guess i got to have it replaced. I've tried everything else. And so they, they've been humbled to that position of I better just – bite the bullet and all of that time of delays and you know synzisc and injections and you know, you know steroids whatever has gone on all of that has you know been concurrent with the decline in performance really a decline in strength and bend yes wow so so you're working on the next thing that we should we will see would be an actual study that takes a little bit of what you've, you've been sharing with the, the comparison to the Kalatayud study, but it'll be a, a new study about uh, prehab strength range of motion and results post-surgery. Is that, that basically where we're headed? That's basically it. Now, okay. you know, when we say patients lose strength, we, people often think that's because their muscles have atrophied. And they may have atrophied some, but the problem is that their legs are getting swollen. It hurts. They're damaging their tissues. Their legs are swelling. And the water, the fluid in the knee pushes on the nerves and causes the nerves not to be able to send signals as well to the muscles. And that is what's meant by arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Right. Okay. And that actually accounts for the lion's share of the loss of strength is this arthrogenic muscle inhibition. And what we find is that with prehab, and especially, I believe, with X10 prehab, that we remove the arthrogenic muscle inhibition by removing the swelling. And that enables the, the, the nerves to tell the muscles to, to contract, to work. And, and that's part of the secret of the X10. It's not just a loss of muscle that's not the, as much of the culprit as is this fluid that's getting in the way of the signals to use your muscles, it sounds like. Is that about that's right? That's right. That's okay. about right. Okay. So it's a little bit of a technical term here, but AMI, arthrogenic muscle inhibition, fluid inhibiting synapses firing, and that thing is, uh, is lurking in the background where, yeah, your legs are strong, but you can't really 
activate, use them like you, you would have expected. One leg isn't doing what the other leg is because of the, the fluid, the swelling. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground here. Um, yeah. So, uh, Gia, is there anything else we should be uh, covering right now? This has been really great. I, well, I, about uh, the, only, the only other thing I would say is people need to know kind of what range of motion they need to be able to achieve in order to engage in real-life activities. And what we yeah. found is that that's about 110 degrees. Right. There's a, a, a wonderful paper out by a guy named Rowe who looked at all of these things and looked at what it te- took to in, engage in activities. And he said about 110 degrees is what you need. And that so is. that's what we've been using. Right, right. And that's also a little bit of a magic number uh, for using a stationary bike, which is another key to this whole thing. A lot of our mm-hmm. patients end up jumping on that thing when the X10 has gone just to maintain the gains that they've achieved and not, you know, not yeah. have any regression. So. Very interesting. Uh, okay, Dr. Freeman, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. We've gone through some really Glad wonderful to topics. It. Yeah, no, it's Glad great. To do it. It's great because, you know, I can, I can do the research. I can go talk about lots of stuff. But having someone who's authored the studies, who's in the middle of current studies, is doing comparisons, um, you know, I hear the passion in your voice. <laughs> and I said earlier, you know, Shout from the mountaintops, you know, hey, look here, everyone. There's this thing that works very well. And, you know, the research is one of those key conduits, right, that we can get the word out to the medical population, the medical community. Yeah. Pretty neat. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for jumping on the call. And, and I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the reactions to this because I, I know hundreds and hundreds of people are going to listen to this thing and it's going to, you know, hopefully impact them. So thanks again. Okay, take care. Maybe you would like to be a guest on the show. That would be terrific. I welcome all perspectives related to knee surgery and recovery. You could be a patient. Maybe you're a physical therapist or an orthopedic surgeon or other medical professional. All welcome. Just email me at thebeesneespodcast at gmail.com. Again, thebeesneespodcast at gmail.com. I'll get right back to you, and we could schedule a conversation and share your learnings related to this field. It's an ever-expanding world, uh, ever-improving world for patients, and I'd love to hear any technologies or news that you have from your seat. So feel free to reach out to me. I'd like to encourage you to go to x10therapy.com and click on the blog tab because we do have an ongoing blog, the X10 Metablog, which is filled with useful information for those that have surgery upcoming. We also have a couple email series, one for patients that are having a tough recovery, the other one for people that have surgery upcoming. There's a lot there at x10therapy.com. So visit that site and poke around a little bit. Uh, I'm sure you'll find some value beyond... uh, propaganda about the X10, you'll find a lot of great uh, help in terms of tactics and techniques and useful tips on uh, getting the most out of your knee surgery and recovery. To learn more, visit X10therapy.com, 1-855-910-5633. Just a reminder, it's a huge help if you subscribe to, rate, and review our podcast. It helps people find us. X10, back to full strength.